Great. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to February's monthly lecture. I'm very pleased that we have been able to invite Michal Kopecek, who is uh, a fellow here, and he's from the Czech Academy of Sciences. Um, he's been doing some very interesting, detailed work on the debates going in, going on within the opposition in Eastern Europe between 68 and 89, primarily focusing on Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, and I would say probably the, the Czech lands within that, and, uh, uh, and Hungary. And he's going to talk to us for about 40, 45 minutes. Then we're going to have questions. Um, and then we will be rewarded with a little glass of wine and some cheese downstairs, if we so wish. Michal. Thank you very much. Uh, let me Thank hand you. over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Michal. Thank you all uh, for coming uh, to this lecture. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to uh, talk about this bit of my research uh, here at EVM. This is the first time that I'm not going to talk about republicanism and republican understanding of human rights and about Patochka as a one of the prominent thinkers um, in this tradition. Um, and I'm very glad that I have the opportunity to uh, actually start. Uh, the only other uh, appropriate place would be uh, Faculty of Arts in Prague, probably. And Eva M is just as good and uh, one of the best places in the world uh, to have the opportunity to speak about it. Now, this talk um, is a part of a bigger uh, canvas that I'm trying to paint, uh, or paint uh, in my book in effort to, to, to uh, show the astonishing variety of uh, uh, dissident discourses uh, and ideological uh, uh, understandings of uh, human rights, uh, which itself, I think, is nowadays a part of a broader collective uh, uh, effort to sort of rediscover the uh, uh, plurality of uh, dissident experience uh, in East Central Europe that was somewhat uh, uh, covered by the uh, victorious liberal narrative of human rights after 1989. So in the book, I write about uh, five major political languages um, of human rights that uh, are detectable in the dissidents. I write about socialist, liberal, republican, Christian, and nationalist uh, languages of uh, human rights. Uh, which is, of course, a typological model, uh, not entirely exhaustive, but I think and I believe this is quite uh, representative. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to illustrate of how these different groups and different ideological uh, positions speak about human rights. They have obviously very different stresses, very different emphases uh, of human rights. And I'm always picking up a couple of personalities who show me the modalities of how how the people spoke about it. So in the, in the socialist, I take mostly uh, Czech socialist uh, uh, thinkers, uh, Jiří Hayek, more social democratic, versus Petr Uhl, who is much more radical, uh, democratic and radical socialist, trying to show how you know, different socialist positions would understand and speak about human rights. The same with liberals. I pick up the uh, uh, Janos Kish uh, as, as the social uh, liberal. I pick up Jörg Konrad as the more, more traditional uh, Alt-Liberale, I would call it in, in, in German, and uh, uh, Miroslav Jelski, the, the, the Polish neoconservative, neoliberal uh, uh, guru, uh, so to say. The same I will do today with uh, Republican uh, human rights in uh, dissidents. Uh, so I really focus today only on this one, which I think is at the same time one of the most uh, innovative and maybe also uh, controversial. We'll see uh, how it works. I'm very excited about the research, so I'm also very excited about uh, your reactions to some of my, uh, let's say, preliminary conclusions uh, on this research. So republicanism, to speak about uh, republicanism in uh, Central European dissent is not uh, self-evident. Uh, very few, if any, uh, uh, dissidents really identified with a uh, republican position. Almost nobody really uh, was noticing the uh, rising debate uh, in Western countries on republicanism, which comes from uh, mostly uh, the Cambridge School of History of Ideas, Quentin Skinner, John Pocock, and others. Uh, there were some Hungarian historians, but this did not really play a big role in the, uh, in the opposition. And yet, Republican interpretation of dissidents was, uh, 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 or appeared in, uh, 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 among the observers of dissidents very early on in 1980s in the effort 
to try to capture the specificity of uh, Central European uh, dissident uh, uh, experience. Now, these interpretations were never uh, prevailing in the research. Um, the most frequent object of Republican reading was quite obviously solidarity, trade union movement, whose uh, participatory and egalitarian political culture was read in the spirit of ancient republicanism. So Gdansk and Athens, right? This was the, 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 the watchword, uh, and this was how, how people were interpreting it. Others were trying to read the whole East European dissidents in a Republican key, uh, and here the emphasis was on civil society and all the derivates that played such an important role uh, in dissident political philosophy and, and practice. Now, these Republican interpretations stress uh, the fact that the dissident civil society uh, was construed as a space independent, obviously, of the despotic state, and a sphere of uncoerced, spontaneous action and self-organizing society, uh, where the stress was on equality, on free speech, uh, on solidarity. So this was a civil society very, very different from the, let's say, classical liberal traditions, uh, where uh, civil society uh, is conceived as this mediating sphere between private interest uh, of the individual and, and the state, which is a guarantor of public order. Now, in contrast with these uh, readings, uh, there was almost no uh, attempt to read uh, dissident or interpret dissident understanding of human rights in Republican key. There is only one, as far as I know so far, this is Magdalena Zolkosz, uh, the uh, uh, Polish uh, political scientist who proposed a civic republican approach to human rights as the most suitable. And I share her insight that indeed civic republican tradition offers a suitable interpretative angle which allows us to uh, name and analyze some of the most fundamental moments uh, of dissident conceptions uh, and, practice of, and practices of human rights. At the same time, I do not accept her suggestion uh, to interpret the whole uh, Polish or East Central European dissidents in a Republican key. I think that the dissident conceptions of human rights cannot be interpreted through a single uh, ideological uh, tradition. I have shown you before that there were uh, clear socialist positions with clear adherence, explicit socialist conceptualization of human rights among the dissidents. There was also a rising or, or growing group of liberal theoreticians of human rights. Uh, in contrast, the uh, uh, republican conception of human rights in dissent was rather and mostly non-explicit and mostly even unconscious, if I can say so. However, I want to argue uh, in my work and today that the republican language of human rights was one of the available human rights languages uh, among the dissidents, and what is more, that it was potentially a game changer, a rival to the liberal language of human rights. And I want to show it on some of the dissident, uh, so to say, intellectual heavyweights, right? Jan Potocka, uh, Jacek Kuroń, and Agnes Heller. And we have all of the three countries that I am, I am focusing on, Czechoslovakia, uh, Poland, and Hungary. Now, uh, if I want, or if we want to engage, uh, uh, if we want to find a workable instrument for uh, talking uh, 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 about notions and understanding that are mostly uh, immanent and non-explicit at a time when they exist, we need to uh, help ourselves a little bit with uh, political theory. So please bear with me for the, the following um, maybe seven, eight, eight uh, minutes. But I am working with a useful scheme offered by French political theorists Luc Ferry and Alain Renaud, uh, who wrote this book uh, in late 1980s, uh, translated then into English too. And they distinguished between three main democratic discourses on human rights. The classical liberal, and the classical is important, uh, socialist and civic republican, uh, with each of those uh, discourses prioritizing their own groups of rights. So the liberals obviously uh, prioritize the uh, question of a, uh, or, or a theme of security of citizens vis-a-vis -vis the state, uh, and thus stressing the salience of a civic and political rights. The socialist view emphasizes the issue of uh, subsistence and substantial equality, thus obviously emphasizing the social economic rights. And finally, civic republican view that stresses rights as an entry point into public affairs, thus civil republicans prioritize the so-called participation rights. Now this is very nice, a little bit superficial, so we have to dig a uh, little bit deeper. Uh, we know, and any theoretician uh, of human rights would tell us, that the difference between uh, liberal and socialist conception of rights is not primarily the content of rights or of claims, 
But actually, uh, these are two distinctively different understandings of what rights stand for. Uh, in the liberal definition, rights are synonymous with permissions for the citizens or limitations uh, for the state. Whereas in the socialist understanding, they function as entitlements of the citizen or guidelines for the state, the gu guidelines of policies to, uh, to make in order to achieve the, uh, uh, the wished for uh, state of affairs. Hence, one cannot say, in contrast to the common understanding, that the primary dissimilarity between these two is that the socialist version is just more inclusive uh, than the liberal one. The rights of the two ideological traditions are not of the same kind uh, and only of different extent, but they are actually of different genus. We can illustrate it by looking at the different understanding of freedom in these two traditions. Uh, liberty in a classical liberal uh, discourse uh, means, uh, as we know, uh, formal guarantees, uh, among others, and, and, and most of all, formal guarantees of citizens vis-à-vis -vis the state and vis-à-vis -vis other uh, powerful social, uh, social institutions. Uh, that means that it is primarily a negative freedom, uh, which is emphasizing the absence of constraint. Um, freedom, in contrast, freedom in socialist discourse is intrinsically linked to the idea of social justice, without which liberty is merely a formal equality before the law. So socialist tradition therefore promotes, as we know, the positive uh, notion of freedom, supported by more extensive uh, provisions of positive rights, entitlements, which are necessary for uh, self-realization, be it uh, individual or collective self-realization. And consequently, then the classical liberal and the socialist uh, uh, traditions would disagree on most other crucial political concepts, be it democracy, be it equality, be it state, be it uh, civil society. Now, uh, you understand that this is a somewhat schematic model, right? It is based on the historical development of the 19th and 20th century. However, it is abstracted, so to say, to the, to the highest degree. And this is because the purpose here is not historical analysis. The purpose here is a conceptual framework that uh, uh, enables us to define the third position, namely the civic republicanism, which is presented sometimes as a kind of middle way approach between the liberal and the socialist uh, uh, understanding, or kind of synthesis. I think it's a little bit misleading, but we can now uh, work with that. The Republican view introduces the category of participation rights, including both uh, the positive, that is socio-economic aspects, but also the negative, civil political aspects of rights. So the main difference, and I'm sort of like, again, um, summarizing, the main difference of Republican human rights from the liberal and socialist uh, rights are schematically. First, in the Republican tradition, the human rights are understood as intersubjectively developed, integral element of political community and the practice of citizenry. So it is not natural, some kind of like pre-political quality of human rights, as we have usually in the liberal uh, theory of human rights. Human rights come into being by political action and communicative uh, practice of the citizenry, right? Not by some uh, divine gift, not by acknowledgement of some transcendental value. So there is a political background uh, and political action behind human rights. Second aspect, the relationship between democracy and human rights is understood as two-sided and reciprocal one. Uh, and thus it is qualitatively different from the liberal and socialist understanding of rights. It's not the liberal limitations or the socialist guidelines uh, for uh, the development of democracy. In Republican argumentation, human rights and democracy cannot exist separately without uh, each other. So whereas in both the liberal and socialist view, uh, we can theoretically uh, imagine a situation when a benevolent and enlightened despotism, which is heeding some of the rights, would be preferable to bad democracy. For Republican thinkers, this is a uh, uh, thing which is not uh, acceptable at all. And the third point, uh, and I'm almost ready uh, with the, uh, uh, I'm almost done with the theory, theory so don't, don't be afraid. The third point is Republican discourse on, on rights is concerned with a type of democracy which is substantially different from the liberal and socialist models. Uh, because dissimilar as they are, liberalism and socialism treat the issue of uh, citizens' active involvement in political sphere as a secondary to their performance in private and economic spheres. Whereas the model promoted by republicanism emphasizes the importance of human rights for citizens' ability to influence the input in the political and uh, social sphere. And uh, we know that this is, you know, this is also one of the weak spots uh, of uh, most of the republic Republican conceptions, because they 
precondition, the models are preconditioned by constant active involvement of most of the population or majority of the population of the citizens in the social and, and political uh, affairs. But uh, we don't have to speak about it now. We just uh, can keep it in mind. So today, uh, civic republicanism, as uh, some of you might know, is, let's say, a lively ideological position uh, and theoretical uh, discussion in political theory in uh, many Western countries. And the, and let's say, Anglophone uh, space is leading the way, but it is not only there. Uh, sometimes it uh, gets to the politics, and the Spanish uh, socialist governments under Zapatero, uh, republicanism and participative democracy was the leading principle uh, of, of the ruling. And it likes to present itself as a viable uh, democratic alternative uh, to liberalism. It's never nowhere. It's it's a real mainstream, I would say, but it's it's a powerful thing. Uh, there are two traditions which are not so. Im I mean, they are important for us, but we can leave it uh, aside for uh, for a while. Uh, two major traditions, and they would call it Neo-Athenian traditions, which is derived from Hannah Arendt. It's much more radical democratic. It's much more uh, putting stress on participative uh, democracy. And this is important for us, for us and for the dissident understanding of democracy. And the other one, which is mainstream today at Western universities in political uh, theory and in some countries, is the neo-Roman republicanism, which sort of like its gen genealogy goes back to uh, obviously the Roman uh, Republic, uh, but the revival came really in 1970s, 1980s with the Cambridge School, with Skinner, Pettit, and others. And this, the neo-Roman gives much less sort of stress and is much more wary of uh, direct democracies. But okay, as I said, um, we can we can come to this. To, um, uh, uh, it is relevant for my topic, but uh, it is not. Um, we don't have to dwell on it right now, uh, also because of the time. I would like to uh, get now to. Uh, one of my heroes. Uh, I promised uh, to speak about uh, Patochka, Havel, Kuroń, and Heller. I don't manage uh, all four of them at a full degree, so my stress will be on Patochka and Kuroń, uh, because they are really the most, um, uh, so let's say, or one of the uh, two of the most influential uh, Republican thinkers in dissidents. Uh, Patochka, uh, I don't think I have to introduce him at length here. Um, the most important Czech philosopher uh, of the 20th century, one of the greatest uh, uh, phenomenologists in the 20th century, uh, with not exactly easy academic life. As we know, uh, uh, he could not teach most of his life. He could not teach under the Nazi occupation. He could not teach again as a bourgeois philosopher after 1951. With a very short uh, time, 68, 69, 670, then he was banned from teaching again from 1970 uh, 1972. Only very few of his books uh, and articles were published uh, during his life, so most of his stuff was circulating in typescripts and manuscripts uh, among his uh, uh, followers and, 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 and pupils. And this is actually thanks to his uh, sort of dissident uh, students uh, in, 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 in Prague and in Czechia, and uh, also partly to uh, this institution where the Patočka archive, uh, which was collecting the works of Patočka, was, uh, was, was keeping and publishing uh, Patočka work, uh, Patočka's works uh, from 1980s onwards up until today. Actually, that we have uh, now uh, uh, quite a lot of his stuff published, not everything yet. Uh, and yet, despite all these impediments, uh, uh, political impediments, uh, so to say, Patochka established the most powerful and most influential philosophical school in nowadays Czechia, the Patochki and uh, phenomenologists. And he also has uh, many followers and interpreters around the world. Uh, Many of you also know that Patochka was also a central figure for the beginnings of Charter 77 uh, movement. Uh, he became to be uh, one of the first three spokespersons, next to Václav Havel and Jiří Hayek. And he was also the first martyr of uh, Charter 77, because he died March 77, as a consequence of a harsh and exhaustive uh, interrogation by political police. But it's not this martyrdom that influenced uh, Charter 77 the most. It is actually some of it, Patochka's philosophical concepts that he developed, especially in his later uh, period, and uh, sort of philosophy of history and phenomenology of freedom. So these notions of life in truth, uh, these notions such as solidarity of the shaken, they made a very specific career in the dissident community in Czechoslovakia. And it gave Charter 77 a specific philosophical frame, but it gave it also a very strong model Sometimes we can even say moralistic or moralizing charge, uh, which is really palpable also in comparison with the other uh, dissident groups in, uh, in the region. 
Now, uh, Patochka's views on human rights. Uh, this is not an easy uh, uh, issue. This is not easy to conceptualize because Patochka was not particularly engaged uh, with the human rights doctrine. He was not engaged in the, with the concept of human rights. And as far as I know, Ludger will tell me more. Maybe uh, I did not read the whole uh, over of Patochka. This is not. This is not for. Uh, this is not possible. But as far as I know, there is there is very little in Patochka early writing on the concept of human rights. But he wrote these two influential short essays uh, when he became the spokesperson of Charter 77, in constantly interrogated by the, uh, uh, by the police. But he wrote these uh, two essays on Charter 77 and human rights, where he gives this uh, deeper moral meaning of the Charter initiative. Uh, these are uh, short essays uh, written in very sort of like understandable, approachable language, not so philosophical, right? They became instantly to be a part of the treasure of Charter 77. Uh, sort of self-understanding and Chartists, uh, led by Havel, but also many others, started actually to, to, to interpret Charter 77 in, in very Patochkian terms, uh, at least at the, uh, at, the, at the beginning. However, if you read it, I would think and I would claim that we could find very little in these essays that could be construed as a republican understanding of human rights. So. We have to look a little bit closer at Patochka's philosophical thought, uh, which led him to the involvement uh, in Charter 77. And we discover a world of thinking about politics and freedom that is closer, and this is, this is my main claim about Patochka, this is a closer to Republican thought than any other political tradition, including uh, liberalism and, and socialism. So Patochka was not thinking about himself as a Republican, but his thinking about freedom and his thinking about rights was uh, very Republican. Now, I don't have uh, time to go, obviously, into the whole uh, argument that I'm trying to construct in my text. So I only three main points. Uh, first one, which I'm calling Arendtian moment uh, in Patochka. Patochka followed uh, Arendt, he knew her, he followed Arendt uh, throughout uh, his life. He was struggling with Arendt's uh, writings, uh, sometimes moving closer, sometimes moving away from her in time. In his late phase, however, he was quite inspired by Arendt, and especially by her The Human uh, Condition from uh, 1958. Like her, Patochka also located the birth of truth and birth of history and the birth of politics as we know it uh, in the public sphere of the Greek polis, where persons as free members of community uh, that is in protected social space create this community, create public sphere, and where truth can appear through polemos, that is the uh, uh, free and public engagement and argument of citizens. Now, in contrast to this uh, Greek situation, to the Greek polis, um, he came with the image of European modernity, uh, with its 19th century myth of progress, which was to Patochka progress only as a, as a self-sustenance, or progress in material progress. Uh, modern individualism, a product of the bourgeois revolutions, was uh, equality of and freedom of roles, not equality and freedom of persons for Patochka. And from this Patochka's a little bit Heideggerian perspective, for him, totalitarianism and democracy, liberalism and socialism are the same because they all objectify persons and reduce them to their social roles. All of these uh, sort of modern political orders, uh, technological orders, center life around work and reproduction. So Patochka agreed with uh, Arendt from the human condition that modern humans were reduced to the laboring animals. And to free ourselves from this modern, modern progressivist predicament was the task of uh, philosophy, philosophy as a vocation, not as a professional discipline. So this was the first moment. The second moment, notion of freedom and uh, community. Patochka was optimist in pessimistic uh, times. He believed that despite the catastrophic outcome of the world wars resulting from this supremacy, what he understood as a technological reason, there was a chance. Uh, there was a chance, but the precondition for it was active partaking in history. Now, freedom for him was a self-affirmation and ability to act that, in his view, constitutes history as we know it. It constitutes history as res geste, things being done. This is how the European mind and European philosophy understood history. Therefore, as humans, we are rooted in history, that is, we are determined by history in many, many ways, but we are also able to rise above history, uh, above the anonymity of the overall context, and transform the context into our own environment. 
this ability, this ability to actively pursue uh, freedom, however, depends very much on the existence of the freedom of others. Hence, the pursuit of freedom demands public space, uh, which makes the dialogue among active, mutually responsible and self-conscious citizens possible. So freedom demands police, and police enables uh, freedom. So this all looks already quite Republican, uh, but I think in Patoshka we have to go uh, still a little bit further and we have to mention some of his darker tones uh, in his late uh, writings. The central notion of the solidarity of the shaken, which uh, had uh, really great resonance uh, uh, among the Charter 77 community, comes, as we know, from the last of uh, parts of his heretical essays, uh, which is one of the last uh, works that he has done. And in these essays, Patochka thinks about the 20th century in Europe as a, as a century of permanent war. It is a century of uh, great mobilizing society, doesn't matter if it is like war-like state or it is a peaceful but still so very mobilizing societies. Uh, most famous are here the passages uh, where, with reference to Tyler de Chardin and Ernst Jünger, uh, Patochka treats the frontline experience of the soldiers of the First World War as an extreme and effective form of shattering of the meaning. So the, there is abyss, uh, there is a complete shattering uh, of, of the meaning, which for Patochka is also a chance, a chance to potentially establish, uh, to, to create a possibility of new, uh, new beginning, a new world. However, the prerequisite for this uh, is to uh, abandon what Patochka uh, was uh, describing as the perspective of the day. So the perspective of the rational ordering of the world and to adopt something that he called the perspective of the night, of being the perspective of being thrown into the radicality of uncertainty and instability. Now, of course, these are quite evocative, rather aesthetic passages than, than let's say, philosophically precise uh, passages. And sometimes it led, as far as I know, it led to quite a controversies among the interpreters of uh, Patochka. I don't want to go uh, into that direction, however, I consider this aspect of the night, this power of negativity in a life experience, uh, which is opened by the perspective from the position of the death, of the meaninglessness, of nothingness, to be a very important element of Patochka's construction of possible new community, of new possibilities of communication, new interaction based on the, and here again the central notion, on the solidarity of the shaken. So this is a maybe at its beginnings quite a Heideggerian maybe even pessimistic, uh, death-related perspective, but it's, I think it's very Arendtian in its outcome, radical new pluralism, radical new uh, beginning. And what we see here, and this is the last bit on Patochka, we see here is a evolution of understanding of the notion, Patochka's understanding of the notion of freedom, which could be, uh, uh, which, is, which is a freedom as a dangerous experience, dangerous experience marked above all by uncertainty. I especially like Francesco Zava's notion of dangerous freedom. I mean, he thinks like Patochka writes about and develops this notion of dangerous uh, freedom. It's not light freedom that uplifts us uh, from conflicts that we are going through. It's a dark freedom, it's a dangerous freedom, it's a freedom that is found in the eye of, in the eye of a cyclone. This is a freedom that is found at the peak of a conflict itself, or this is a freedom which is found in the abyss, this is, a, this is a freedom which is uh, found in a situation of ultimate uh, desperation only. And Tava actually demonstrated in, in his dissertation how this dangerous precariousness, how this freedom characterized by uh, primarily elements of risk uh, reappears in Patochka's uh, work from his uh, major work, actually published work, uh, uh, no, it was not published, but it was finished work, a negative Platonism uh, from the late 1940s, and the quotation here is from negative Platonism, so this is the beginning when Patochka starts to think about uh, this freedom, which I interpret as a, as, a, as a Republican understanding of freedom. And so this dangerous uh, freedom goes through in, in Patochka's writing through his reflection of the Prague Spring in the late uh, 60s up to his late essays and up to his uh, Charter 77 engagement. So this is in this connection with the power of the negativity in, in late Patochka that I have called this uh, Patochkin republicanism a negative uh, republicanism. And I have to say that I'm still playing with the notion I, because I, it seems to me that it's really capturing something very important in Patochka. Uh, it's also sort of like pairing with the negative Platonism, but I think I'm afraid that it could also be misleading, so I'm very eager to uh, hear uh, what you think about it. Uh, Havel. Uh, 
I promised you to speak, I uh, promised in the abstract of the lecture to speak about Havel a little bit, to speak about the Republican motifs uh, in his thought, but I really don't have time to go on with it. I don't, in contrast to Patochka, I don't want to claim that Havel was a Republican thinker uh, at all. Havel was not a coherent political thinker in general, so he, had, he was sort of like more, he was accepting motives from all over and uh, doing some kind of very interesting synthesis out of it. Uh, but what I wanted to show, and this is a quotation from Havel's text that he wrote to the 10th anniversary of Charter 77 for Samizdat uh, in 86. And I actually wanted to show through this quotation and a couple of other quotations in the text how this Patochkian and generally Republican philosophical motifs were permeating uh, the Czech dissident, not just Havelian, but Havelian, through Havel, the Czech dissident discourse uh, in this time. So you, what you can see here is something that is really rarely uh, noticed in Havel, and, and this is what I see as a, this Republican pathos on the renewed citizenship, or renewed sense of citizenship, which is a preconditions for any uh, political action and also this stress on a freedom of active, uh, uh, as an active creation of a community, something that is not given you by the institutions, but something that you have to create uh, on your own. Anyway, I said I have no, you can still uh, enjoy uh, some of the uh, parts of the quotation, but I have to move to Kuroń, my main uh, second character tonight. Uh, uh, Polish, one of the greatest Polish dissidents, unlike Patochka, who sort of like became dissident only last months of his life. Uh, up to that point, he was not really politically engaged. Kuroń was the you know dissident born. He was a notorious oppositionist. He was a part of the radical leftist Marxist opposition uh, already since 1950s. 1964, together with Karol Modzelewski, they were at that point uh, lecturers uh, of history at Warsaw University. They uh, they they published this famous open letter to the party, which was a Trotskyite very harsh critique of a party bureaucratic uh, dictatorship, calling for a rupture with the system and establishment of a true workers' democracy in both political and economic sense. They were jailed, but it did not deter Kuroń. He became to be a part, actually, core of the opposition. He was one of the founding members of the uh, uh, COR, the Workers' uh, Defense uh, Committee. He was his greatest strategic mind, and then he was also one of the uh, greatest strategic minds of solidarity. So in the literature on historical memory, uh, and in historical memory, I'm sorry, Kuroń is considered to be the most important dissident strategist uh, in Poland. And I agree with that. Uh, we know how central the concept of um, civil society was for, uh, for dissident uh, movement, and Kuroń was its central representative uh, in Poland with his, with his famous conception of self-organizing society, which became to be a part of uh, his political theory of the opposition. But, Again, I'm interested more in Kuroń uh, and his view on human rights. Uh, uh, now again, similar to Patochka, Kuroń does not comment anywhere on his understanding of human rights substantively. Human rights figure uh, as a self-evident unifying element of the opposition, human rights figure for him as a higher value, the defense of which gives the opposition a fundamental platform and its cohesion. He even occasionally, and this is interesting, refers to human rights, uh, or rather civic and political rights, as freedoms as the old liberal freedoms, uh, which led many people to see Kuroń as a leftist that simply accepted the liberal democratic minimum for democracy to work. Now, my view, and this is, I think, this would be the mainstream interpretation of Kuroń, uh, both in Poland and outside. My view is different. I claim that what we see in Kuroń more than any other splendid minds of the Polish opposition at that time, and they had many splendid minds, is a radical Republican concept in the making, even though Kuroń did not have the language. He did not have the Republican language, he did not read the Republican uh, theory, so he did not have the language to conceptualize it, but I think that, I, that we can read uh, Republicanism through Kuroń. Again, three main points to so do it, uh, make it somewhat symmetrical to Patochka. First, democracy. Uh, Kuroń's uh, radical understanding of democracy went far beyond the, let's say, pr procedural parliamentary uh, democracy. Uh, when pondering about the goals of democratic opposition, he made it explicit that even though but it was not ultimate aim, at the same time, parliamentary democracy was essentially, <coughs> without representative democracy, direct democracy, which is his goal, is absolutely powerless when it confronts the state. So we see there is a... Uh, liberal democratic minimum, right? Uh, and this, is, this was a lesson learned by most of the radical Democrats 
in this end and outside of this end in East Central Europe. If you don't have formal democracy, the direct democracy cannot really exist. Uh, however, similarly to many other dissidents in Poland and else elsewhere, this liberal parliamentary democracy was uh, definitely not final goal for Koroń, but rather a step towards a true democratic project, which was a citizen-based, self-organizing democratic uh, society. But there is also another element that is animating Kuroin's writing at that point, especially his numerous polemics with all possible uh, sort of dissident, uh, fellow dissidents. Uh, and this is the question of unity and plurality within the opposition, and in a way, pro futuro also within the uh, democratic uh, society. So Kuroin focused uh, a lot on the construction of political pluralism within the opposition. Why? Because Kuroin understood maybe better than anyone else uh, that without exception, all ideological currents in the opposition, liberal, conservative, radical, socialist, uh, nationalist, religious, carried within them the germs of authoritarianism and totalitarianism. And this germ was in the form of a temptation to subordinate all activities of the opposition to a single substantial uh, overriding value whether it was nation and national independence with the nationalists, whether it was church teaching and religious freedom with the Catholic opposition or social justice with the, with the radical uh, socialist. So it is in this area, the maintaining of internal pluralism uh, while at the same time also keeping the oppositional unity that we have to look for uh, Kuroin's understanding of human and civic rights, uh, which are, as I say, uh, largely otherwise immanent in his texts. So for Kuroin, the former uh, radical revolutionary, the concept of human rights uh, indeed had distinctive liberal aspects in the understanding of political freedoms and their defense against the communist state in the sense of non-interference of the liberal understanding of freedom. But there is also a palpable republican motif uh, in his understanding of political liberties and rights, rights as participatory rights. In other words, rights, rights guaranteeing individual autonomy understood as a personal sovereignty creating possibility of self-determination, which is, again, individual or collective. But uh, what is interesting is that this kind of mixture <coughs> of liberal and republican motifs was not Kuroin's specificity among the dissidents. We could find very similar motifs, very similar mixture in Michnik, in Havel, in Georg Konrad and others. The republicanism of individual dissident thinkers, as I conceptualize it in my approach, uh, is a question of degree to which republican core motifs are present in their thinking. Uh, and, and they are relative to the core motifs and arguments of other ideological traditions. So for instance, and I'm working here and I'm inspired very much by Michael Frieden's um, uh, understanding or morphological theory of political ideologies. So Michnik, Havel and many others have republican motifs in their thinking, but morphologically they are not leaning towards republicanism because the other motifs are overwhelming this, this republicanism. So Havel and Michnik both are much more liberal than republican, not so with Kuroin. And this is my third point, and I think this is, this is I dare to say, this is, this is the uh, most interesting uh, part of my Kuroinian interpretation, uh, community values and their transcendental anchoring. Now, self-professed lifelong leftist Kuroń, uh, I claim, was more Republican than most of his fellow dissidents in his emphasis on the need for shared values that shape the political community, and in his effort to reconcile these supreme values and the demands of the community with the notion of individual freedom and autonomy. Uh, the political anthropology that lurks from behind these uh, strategic writings of Kuroin in the 1970s has been formed in a uh, cultural process that was remarkable in Poland going on from 1970s, 1960s, 1970s. A dialogue between the secular uh, uh, anti-religious left uh, on one hand and, the, and Christianity and Polish Catholicism on the other hand. Some of the most fam famous names of this debate, uh, Kolakowski, Michnik, uh, Bogdan Cywinski, Józef Tischner, Father Zdzieja, uh, Lipski and, and many others. Kuroń was a relative latecomer in this process and he was also not the most quoted one on this account. But some of his essays, uh, I'm quoting two most important them, Christians Without God from 75 and The Evil That I Do from uh, 81, were well, are actually quite well remembered in the uh, oppositional milieu in Poland. But I read these essays primarily as a Kuroin's effort at value foundation of a community, a new community based on a new plurality, founded not on liberal tolerance, because liberal tolerance is weak. You know, once the main enemy is, is, is away, communism will uh, disappear, the tolerance will also disappear. 
but it should be it should be plurality founded on, on something deeper, on deeper bond, on value sharing that comes only from a difficult dialogue about higher and thus ultimately irreconcilable uh, values. And I'm so this is a this is a part of Kurun that is very much reminding me of Patochka and his concept of polemos. You know, people have to struggle, have to come into the argument and have to argue for uh, higher uh, values. Akuron knows Akuron is a dialectician. He is a, he is schooled as a, as a Marxist. He knows that the fundamental principles in life always inevitably contradict each, each other. So that is the urge to love one's neighbor, the desire to merge and be one with the other hum human being, but that is also the demand to respect the autonomy of the individual. Uh, uh, that is the demand of tolerance of difference. And Kuron says, if we are to live humanly, if we are to create in love and strive for the realization of superior values, we must strive for the realization of these values at every moment of our life. However, we must not subordinate the other person to these uh, values. Otherwise, there is a constant potential threat that our efforts to realize these higher values, uh, for example, the idea of nation or the idea of just society, will result in authoritarianism. So authoritarianism. So instead of love, we preach hatred. Although not formulated as an explicit republican concept of freedom, we see that Kuron's characterization of liberty is a liberty as non-dominance, so not merely non-interference. Non individual rights and individual autonomy are, for Kuron, the most fundamental principles of human rights in general. The primary reason, however, is not the liberal delimitation of public and private spheres, but the necessity for securing freedom as a form of personal and collective uh, autonomy. So really, uh, I would say, Republican human rights par excellence as participatory uh, rights. The uh, funny thing is that Kuron himself calls these rights occasionally, occasionally liberal principles because he does not have the language, he does not have a different frame at disposal, but he also makes uh, very clear in his writings how easily liberalism can compromise on this, uh, on this understanding of human rights. So, Patochka and Kuron, uh, I don't really have time for Heller, but I'm only keeping you al almost uh, 45 minutes. Uh, the most uh, Heller was the most, uh, so, uh, so very shortly on Heller. Uh, Heller. Heller was the most consciously Republican thinker of the three. She speaks about herself in the late 80s as a Republican, unlike Patochka and, and, and Kuron. At the same time, he, she also f uh, is the least fitting into the category of dissident at that time. Uh, she was a dissident for a good uh, portion of her life and in many forms since the 1950s through the 1970s. But since I think 1977, she emigrated, um, uh, she lived in exile, teaching uh, in, in, in Melbourne, uh, 1980s, and since 1986, uh, having actually the Hannah Arendt Chair uh, of uh, Philosophy at the New York School of Social uh, Research. So she, you know, she was not dissident at the, the time that, that, that we are speaking about. In rough outlines, she follows similar path to Kuron, uh, that is from radical socialism and Marxism towards radical democracy as a part, not as an alternative to liberal democracy, but as a part of, of uh, representative uh, democracy. But Heller's path, uh, path is different, it is much less activist than Kuron, it is much, 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 much more intellectual, much more uh, academic. Uh, but at the same time, as I said, she's only the only one who explicitly subscribes to republicanism, who explicitly subscribes uh, to Hannah Arendt. And this is partly also because she was uh, teaching and living in the West. So she was following the discussion which people like Kuron did not have the chance to follow. So only very telegraphically. In 1980s, uh, Heller is part and actually one of the most important representatives of the so-called Budapest School, uh, who were at that point at the forefront of a Western discussion on radical democracy with the major principle being a collective self-management. Uh, uh, they, they distinguished themselves, the Budapest School distinguished themselves by two, uh, uh, two aspects. First, that they were calling for the need to incorporate the experience of Eastern Europe into these theoretical dis discussions. They were very sort of uneasy about the fact that most of Western Marxists were ignoring the experience of Eastern Europe, uh, not taking it really uh, seriously. And second aspect, which is interesting and, 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 and uh, had a quite uh, uh, important consequences, was their in major inspiration. Once these people, they, most of them were pupils and students of Georg Lukács, the greatest Marxist philosopher uh, definitely in the region and one of the greatest in the world, I would say. Once they were abandoning Lukácsian Marxism, 
and looking for other inspiration, they started to be inspired by another Hungarian-born uh, 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 great mind, and this is Karl Polanyi and the Great Transformation, which brought them to quite different understanding of uh, what is state, what is market capitalism, what is uh, formal uh, democracy. Uh, in a nutshell, what they suggested was a radical democracy, which was an alternative to both existing systems, not only to state socialism, which they criticized heavily, but also to the liberal uh, democracy in the West. So radical democracy, uh, which is a radicalization of formal democracy, where the most fundamental feature is the equal right to participate in social decision making. And this is a position um, which I said, like Heller really tried and helped to, uh, to to develop. This is a position that she's writing her quite famous, like not like I mean, she wrote a, a lot of famous uh, writings. This one is quite. Uh, I mean, it's definitely interesting for me. Uh, it's, it's not the fam most famous of her uh, uh, work. The Great Republic in 1985, uh, published first in Praxis International, uh, which is her model of a republican order, a specific combination of direct and representative democracy. It is inspired by uh, explicitly by Republican thinkers. She refers to Kant, she refers to uh, Rosa Luxemburg, whom she in, in, in interprets as a Republican socialist uh, uh, philosopher and theoretician, and she also picks up on uh, Hannah Arendt. But she also claims, and this is also interesting, she also claims, um, connecting actually to, to uh, some of the arguments of Andrei Walitsky, that actually there is a specific Republican uh, political experience in, uh, in East Central Europe, which of course like, dates back to the Polish Noble Republic, which however in the 20th century made a special reappearance in the protest movements uh, against state socialism. Uh, for Heller, the most important and absolutely like, formative experience is obviously Hungarian Revolution 1956. But she said this is also Czechoslovak Prague Spring uh, uh, movement, and this is also obviously the solidar solidarity time in Poland. Now, for me, the interesting thing, and the most interesting thing, apart from the fact that she is calling it really republicanism, so this is also proof that, okay, there was some republicanism uh, even explicitly, is her theory of human rights, which is underlying this uh, model of, of the Great Republic which is, again, a Republican concept of human rights par excellence. Uh, she speaks about three levels of, uh, where do I have it over down there? Three levels of human rights. So human rights that you have as a person, which is the, the right of personal autonomy. Human rights that you have as a participating member of a social body. So this is the rights of social participation. And, per and rights that you have as a person of participate, as a person participating member in political body, that is political rights or rights of political participation. Now, her Heller's republicanism, uh, as a, I mean, it, was it is not the most famous part of her, of her writing. Uh, this was mostly reflected not in Eastern Europe, but in Spanish-speaking, especially in Latin American uh, countries, where I mean, many sort of theoreticians um, and some of the political movements picked up on, on her essay. It did not have really influence in Eastern Europe, uh, unlike uh, Kuroń uh, or Patochka. But she's important for me uh, as she is actually mediating between the uh, dissident democratic oppositional uh, political thought and the Western discussion on uh, of republicanism. And Heller is quite clear about the fact that she is connecting to this radical democratic uh, republicanism, a la Hannah Arendt. So her reference point is Margaret Canovan. Her reference point is not uh, Quentin Skinner or uh, Philippe uh, Petit. So, conclusions. Uh, I'm going to free you. Uh, first for discussion and wine. So as uh, I try to show, I'm not trying to uh, claim, uh, as some of the earlier interpretations did, that the political thought and practice of, dissident, uh, of dissidents in East Central Europe was predominantly republican. Uh, as I said, I mean, there is no one ideological or political tradition through which we can interpret the plurality uh, of uh, dissidents. But I am arguing that looking through this republican tradition can help us to understand some of these uh, practices and some of these uh, understandings much better. And I think that the understanding of human rights is one of these uh, things. The second conclusion is more general. The story, as we know, of dissidents uh, in, uh, in the region has been uh, very, or has became immediately in 1989 to be a part of this victorious liberal legitimation narrative, uh, which very quickly lacked to the fact uh, that, that the dissident uh, uh, communities and dissident thinkers in East uh, Central Europe started to be also read as a, some kind of closet liberals in the 1970s and 1980s. Pr so proto-republicanism of dissidents, and this is what how Jerzy Szatsky was calling it. 
As with any triumphant uh, narrative, uh, there is, of course, a grain of truth uh, because liberal values and liberal traditions were indeed uh, re-evaluated uh, among the dissidents. But this does not mean, definitely does not mean, or does not imply that dissidents were liberal or that the prevailing interpretation of human rights was liberal. Uh, and this is precisely why this self-congratulatory liberal narrative of the victory of democracy and human rights uh, in 1989 comes across as a narrative that, to much extent, expropriates the real historical experience of many central actors uh, of this period. And so this is not by chance, by the way, that today you have many people uh, on the barricades against uh, uh, liberal democracy and criticizing the post-communist liberalism who have the dissident experience. So in a way, this is this this is important also for our understanding of the uh, basal plurality of, uh, of dissidents in, in, in the region. And last conclusion is more, more let's say, civic engaged. Uh, at the time of a crisis of uh, liberal democracy and global capitalism, obviously we are looking for democratic alternatives. As I said, the civic uh, republican tradition is presenting itself also in Central European countries as a this democratic alternative. However, as far as I can see, uh, uh, in East Central Europe, it is very often seen as a, or is it understood as too theoretical because it's mostly a transposition of the Anglo-American discussion into uh, these countries. What I want to show by my research is that Republican tradition and Republican thinking are inherent in a local uh, political environment. And if there is a viable Republican historical tradition in East Central Europe, then definitely the dissident uh, period is one of its most important chapters. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Please, Michal, take a seat. Thank you. And thank you very much for that uh, very comprehensive and detailed, uh, well, I'm going to say overview, but it's more than an overview. I'm interested to know... Uh, to what degree the Republican uh, <laughs> conception of human rights is thoroughly extinguished during the 1990s, or does it survive in certain groups? And uh, I mean, th that, that tradition that you identify in the 70s and 80s, how strong did it prove to be later on? I think it did not very much. It did not because there is this weak point I was pointing to, and this is the demand of the radical democratic, this Arendtian interpretation of republicanism, demand for uh, active political participation of the majority of the, of, the, of the population. And this was, you know, this was something why I think, you know, whereas you have a plurality on in dissidents, uh, with a minority of people who were thinking liberal, and I would say, I would say, still in 1987, uh, there were very few real, uh, you know, self-conscious liberals among the dissidents. This is very different uh, among the uh, broader strata of the population and among the middle classes, who, for whom, the last thing that you want from the new political order is a political active political, constant active and permanent active political engagement in politics uh, and maybe also in many social affairs. What people want, I mean this is, this is more social history than intellectual history, what people want is not uh, a political order where you have to take part in the committees uh, every now and then. And I think that this is one of the, this is one of the reasons why these writings by of Heller uh, and why, why also like, you know, people like Kuron who gets into the politics, who approves of the liberal transformation, he's then very much disappointed already in 1993-4. I mean, he's saying that, okay, I failed again. I mean, this is not what we really wanted, but this is something that they really understand. So there is, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, when I am using this concept and when I am sort of trying to revive this tradition, it's not that I think that this was a viable option. It was, a, you know, theoretically it is a democratic alternative to what came about. Today, I think that theoretically it is a democratic alternative that can help us to try to face the impasses of the liberal uh, democratic order that we are uh, nowadays having. So as a historian, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a civic activist, but as a historian, I'm here to sort of offer alternatives that we have not seen anymore in history because it was covered by, by uh, meta-narratives that were uh, very strong and that were sort of going with the, with the time. But uh, as, you know, at, at the same time, I think that the weak point of republicanism 
uh, was the weak point why it did not work after 1989. So it, uh, I don't see that it survived. The funny thing, and the or a funny interesting thing, is that in 19, uh, that is, there are like new, new studies by, by colleagues in, in, in Czechia, but also elsewhere, that in 88 to 89, 90, there was a very strong movement, which was not Republican, it was more like s radical socialist movement in the factories, uh, movement for economic democracy in the factories, right? Uh, this was connected also with the reform uh, that was going on uh, during Perestroika, in different stages, different, different countries. And actually, some of the future tycoons uh, of, uh, of, of capitalism were people who were selected from among these people as the, as the managers of the factory. So they were, you know, uh, I was just speaking two, two weeks ago with Jan Czarnogórski and he said like my brother was actually selected in 89 as, uh, and he then be became one of the big entrepreneurs and he was selected by the, uh, he was an engineer working in a factory and he drew stuff and he was selected uh, by the people democratically in elections to, to lead the factory. Of course, then the transformation went the other way. Economic democracy completely disappeared from political options. It's, you know, there was a movement which somehow like appeared and then very fastly faded away. Uh, but we can see, you know, that the logic of the, of, of the changes did not really wish to go uh, with this radical democratic concept. Again, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that this is a part of the Republican tradition. This was not. This was mostly sort of like workers' economic democracy, so socialist democracy in the factories movement. It was there. It is actually remarkable how little we know about it and how much sources there are about this. I mean, this is what people, people who are studying it are saying. And this is remarkable how fastly it faded away. Uh, in 1993, you don't have any trace about this, uh, with, you know, thing that was traditionally there all the time throughout all these uh, protest rebellions in Eastern Europe. We want not just political, but economic democracy in the factories. We want to decide about uh, our fate. Okay. Very interesting. Um, questions from the floor. Holly, is that you? I can't quite see my. Thanks. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this presentation, and I found it uh, very. Uh, enlightening and exciting. Um, my question is about your um, whether the people you're talking about uh, had an anti-morphological impulse that should be retained. Um, and uh, here I'm thinking of Patochka's language is deliberately not uh, Western language. Um, Kolakovsky uses morphology to try to move beyond morphology. Um, and, and it's not like they're absolutely not aware of other languages. It's that they're suspicious of morphologies, many of them, yep. I think, or that they use morphologies to set up uh, their alternatives, but not within which to place their alternatives. And so I'm wondering if uh, in sort of reinserting them in a morphology, there's, uh, there's something that, that one is doing to them that they wouldn't approve of or that would uh, kind of be uh, against the point that they were trying to make or whether this is a time in which anti-morphological gestures are mm. Duganesque, <laughs> and so this is a different time so morphologies can safely usurp um, the previously anti-morphological -morphologi uh, inclinations. This, this, this is a sm smart question, as, as always, from Holly. Uh, but I, and I, you're right, absolutely, definitely in Patochka, I think, you know, he would, uh, he was a phenomenologist who was trying to find, you, you would say non-morphological, I, I would say like new or different language to say things which are not possible to say by, not just political uh, language, but, but by academic language or philosophical, existing philosophical language, right? Uh, so so, so this, is, this is what the great, as far, yeah, I'm not a phenomenologist, but this is what I find really great in phenomenology, that this is this kind of new uh, language seeking. Uh, uh, and this is a language which has its founding father who settled, but it's a language that goes in so many uh, languages that go in so many directions. So I think that philosophically it would be wrong to interpret Patochka in this way. I'm not even trying this because I'm not a philosopher, but I'm not phenomenologist. 
But I think exactly because Apatochka ends up in Charter 77, exactly because he is interpreted, exactly because, and this is, a, this, this is one now big issue that, that we are dealing with in, in the Czech case, that how much actually Charter 77 Patochkianism is Patochkianism or is this Havelian understanding of Patochka. You know, he is interpreted politically in the sense of anti-political politics that the dissidents want to do. And this gives me, as a historian of political thought and of dissidents, a challenge to try somehow to categorize. So I would agree with you that, especially in the case of Patochka, not Heller and Kuron, because Heller and Kuron, they, they, they were political animals, they wanted to be, they were trained as, you know, in, in certain morphologies, like they were, they were great Marxist thinkers, both of them. Uh, especially Heller was 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 a great one, uh, and they were looking for uh, for alternatives within the existing morphologies. Uh, uh, in a sense that you know, when you are trying to develop the, the concepts of radical democracy, you are connecting to a community of people uh, and 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 the rep um, uh, republic of letters that is that is that is that is that is having certain morphology, and you are trying to intervene and not abolish this morphology, but to make it different or to, to, to make, a, to make an, in, an intervention in existing morphology. So for Heller and Kuron, I, I think that this is, all what I do is legitimate. For Patochka, I agree with you, yes. I am bending him maybe too much because I want to read him, uh, because um, what I'm interested in, in this research, is Patochka as a sort of like, potential political philosopher. I know that there are now more and more writings, and well, beca and exactly because Patochka is somehow <laughs> seen by some of the people, and again, Lud Ludger will, say, will know much more about it, but it seems to me that it, he's seen by some of the people as an alternative to Heidegger. He's, he's sometimes very Heideggerian, uh, in the deepness of his understanding of uh, the, uh, let's say, su subjective and even collective e experience, but the resulting sort of Arientian motives are bringing more and more people towards Patochka who are trying to, to see him as a, a, some kind of political philosopher. So I'm also not alone in this, in this uh, endeavor, but I absolutely agree with you that this is, this is, this is a very specific perspective on Patochka. This is not, I would never claim that this is, uh, th this is representing Patochka as a, as a thinker. Because out of this, you know, I, 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 I really admire Heller. I, well, my first, my dissertation, my first book was partly on Heller from the 50s. I, I read a lot of her. She's a, she's a great philosopher. But out of these three people that I, that I talked about today, uh, Patochka is really, um, he's like, not me, uh, this, is, this is stupid when I say he's the deepest. No, I don't know. But, he's, uh, but, he, but, you, but he is the most that you, uh, what, what you were speaking about, the most anti-morphological. This is a nice, a nice point. I, um, I agree with that. Yeah. But I still ha think that I have a legitimate right to read my Patochka. <laughs> <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <coughs> Thank you very much for the amazing lecture. Um, it would be nice to believe that there was a genuine Central European reinterpretation of republicanism and liberalism, but uh, somebody can say that uh, after all, um, Patochka was influenced by Hannah Arendt and and um, Heller, Agnes Heller was influenced by Hannah Arendt as well. And Kuroń was not that sophisticated philosophically, so it, he doesn't count in that respect. So, so the impact of uh, uh, Hannah Arendt is very strong in some ways. And the other thing is the liberal memory, or the liberal human rights. Um, uh, I, I was talking with Janusz Kisch about that personally, and I know actually from his writings that he was absolutely influenced by Kant and then um, um, Rawls, John Rawls, and then Ronald Dworkin. Yeah. So this uh, American, uh, after Kant, this uh, Anglo-Saxon liberal tradition of, of human rights, which is more about rights and obligations, and after the regime change, Janos Kish was writing more about the role of the constitutional court and you know regulations, uh, principles, but not about less about real people, 
less about you know Republican mm, community. And I wonder whether there was an internal division within this uh, opposition <laughs> the, between the Rosians and the Arentians, because maybe that is simply personal, but Janusz Kisch and Agnes Heller were not in a very good relationship in that, and they did not agree on which liberalism, which human rights concept should be followed. And I wonder whether it was the case in Poland or Czechoslovakia mm. that the the, the human right, the liberal human rightists and the republican human rightists uh, were somewhat separated and parting ways and taking another path. In Hungary, they were not exactly, I mean, in a bro broadly speaking, mm. they were in the same camp, but, uh, but otherwise they were very little in common. Absolutely. No, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think there are many things that, that I would like to comment, so I try to, uh, to keep it um, somewhat concise. First, Janusz Kisz. Uh, I think that, you know, Janusz Kisz, Kisz is, um, if, you know, I was talking about Patochka, one of the deepest thinkers that Janusz Kisz is ju just the another one, uh, both in his Marxist period and then uh, in his liberal period, uh, and liberal democratic, um, as consti a constitutional philosopher, I mean, he's, he's really like one of the great, uh, uh, one of the great. Um, uh, a funny thing with him is that he was, indeed, he's a very academic philosopher, as especially after 1989. But in him, there is always this kind of vestiges of his own civic activism. This is really interesting, right? Uh, but he's really absolutely unique because, you know, I know the story much be better than I do because you sent me the book that you did the, the re interview with him, and I was reading through this book uh, where he's sa having this story that he goes to the flat of, of uh, I think, Janos Kennedy, right? Uh, and then, and he sees, and, and Kennedy has there this 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 uh, New York review of books, uh, which Janos Kisch did not know so much about at that point. But he sees there an article by Dworkin. I think that Dworkin is the first, and he reads it, and then he he da he says like, I didn't know why, I didn't know what this guy was writing about, but his style of argument and the way of he argued was so interesting because I felt that okay, this now makes, could help me somehow to think about human rights. At that point he was, Kish was a really very coherent thinker and he was switching consciously, unlike most of the other dissidents who did not care about these things, he was consciously switching from Marxism towards liberalism. And he said, that, like, and we have to rethink the role of politics, we have to rethink the role of human rights, and he was searching for ways. He came across this Dworkin article of New York Review of Books. He didn't know Dworkin, he didn't know this, this philosophical discussion, but he started to be interested. Then he was uh, searching for more books. Uh, people from, from, from abroad were sending him, him, him books. And he developed already in the 1980s into some kind of like Anglo-American social liberal uh, philosopher of rights. But he's the absolutely only one in the whole region. That I don't know about anybody who would Absolutely. No, in Poland, is inter another inter interesting thing in Poland is like very developed neoliberal, sort of both Hayek and, and the Chicago school kind of um, uh, way of thinking, which, you know, I mean, Poland is the, is the exporter of neoliberalism uh, already in 19, uh, 1980s. Uh, so I, this, is the fun this, is, this is also one of the reasons why I really put so much stress on, this co on, on, on my comparative or transnational way, because uh, you know, these discourses, they are, these are relatively small, small uh, cultures. Okay, Poland is bigger, but still, in, in comparison to like, French or German, discourse is smaller. And when I look at these dissidents, this is also why I always select uh, from different environments, because Czechs are so strong on socialism, right? So select a couple of people and you have really interesting social thinkers. Uh, Hungarians, for some reasons, are really strong on liberalism. I think this is mainly because of, uh, of Kish. Poles are fantastic on, on uh, both radical democracy and conservatism, right? Uh, uh, but still, I mean, Kish is, 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 is very specific. And it's very specific in a way, uh, in the sense that he knows why he's saying these things, and he is really, he's not defending demagogically uh, liberalism a la Rawls, but he's saying this is the way we have to go because this is in a way a combination that we need. Constitutional democracy, um, 
negative, mostly prevailing negative freedom, but very strong sort of social sense. So, uh, so for him, this is a kind of best of the all bad worlds, right? He does not have uh, really uh, matching uh, people in the other environments, because it seems to me that in, you know dissidents were not political philosophers; they were activists. Uh, some of them were lawyers, so their thinking is more sort of maybe precise. Uh, 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 many of them were philosophers, many of them were writers. And when you have this, especially when you have writers and, and playwrights such as Havel, Havel is, you know, you can see Havel as everything. Liberal Democrat, radical Democrat, uh, uh, radical, uh, not radical socialist, no, he's not. Uh, sometimes um, conservative, um, uh, sometimes almost Christian uh, uh, Democrat. And sometimes he's all of these things at the same time. There are Republican motives, there are very strong liberal uh, motives, and he's not a coherent thinker. He, he's able to unite the dissidents, he's able to write in a sense that is understandable to people, but you can't construct political philosophy on his basis. There are some people on the basis of whom you can, and I think those that I selected here uh, are the ones, but they, uh, but yeah, the, f the, the, the most important thing is that uh, most of them, unlike uh, Janos Kish, did not want to develop a, f a specific political philosophy. Kish always wanted to develop specific political philosophy. And you know, for me, the uh, uh, I, I will finish here, uh, but we discussed, Andras, more about it, because for me, the interesting thing is, to what extent, maybe, it was Benze, his uh, pal for many, many years, who was the Republican. You know, I, d I don't know enough on, uh, of, of Benze's writings at this time. He was sort of like sidelined, he did not publish so much, he was still, I think he was also in a position in Australia, right? But it seems to me that Benze is the more Republican of these two than, 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 than Kish. And it would be actually int interesting to go into Benze, but I would have to uh, do more research on that. Uh, I, I, I apologize to... Uh, All right. Sort of like flying. Don't, uh, don't apologize. Uh, Lutke and then here in the middle. So, Michal, thank you very much for this, for this uh, really interesting rereading of uh, the history of uh, Eastern European dissidents. I think it's a, it's a great thing, great approach uh, that offers really interesting perspectives. Um, the one thing that is maybe important to say, one could, you, I mean, you're, you're putting it very cautiously. You're, you're saying I'm only speaking about one strand of it, and it's not even the most important strand. There's many others. Uh, so you're putting it very cautiously, and rightly so. But the consequences of it, I think, can be quite important. Mm. And this, this is what you have outlined at the very end, namely for these two main aspects. The first one, to really understand what happened after 89. I mean, this uh, in at least to some degrees, really unfortunate uh, development of uh, Eastern European dissident, dissidents and Eastern European dissidents, the people themselves that made sometimes really quite astonishing uh, biographical de developments mm. in this period. So I find this very interesting as an approach to, to reread this, to reinterpret this. And the second point, obviously, to say that there is a tradition itself uh, in, in Central Eastern Europe mm to to have a viab viable alternative for a certain disappointment that we that we all too clearly see today so this i think really opens great <coughs> perspectives now on your <laughs> um, uh, attempt i will <laughs> try to say a few words very shortly about this uh, republican rereading um, Agnes Heller is crucial to it. I think she really, and, and I mean, you said it yourself, she really is the one who, des only the only one maybe who deserves the, the word very clearly. So uh, uh, she, she was uh, uh, struggling with this, struggling in a good sense with the uh, republicanism until the very end. I also mention this because the publisher of uh, her uh, later books is here tonight, the Austrian publisher Georg Hauptfeld, <laughs> uh, who did a lot for, for also for the reception of, of uh, Agnes Heller later on. And her last book is Paradox Europa, Paradox Europe. Uh, this once again is ex exactly a working on the p Republican notion of uh, human mm -hmm. rights. And the in, in t this is what why, why she calls it a paradox, the internal struggling of this. On the one hand, it's universal human rights. And on the other hand, mm -hmm. it is also rights that are given to somebody as a citizen of a certain country. And then there is uh, the point where nationalism, etc., comes in. So she de definitely deserves, mm -hmm. deserves this. And I think she is crucial for, for your whole project. Um, I will not say anything on Kuron because I really feel not enabled <laughs> uh, um, to do so. Uh, with Patochka, I have certain problems. Uh, I mean, even if you have this this nice adjective of negative, negative rep republicanism, I have problems with uh, this uh, uh, brand. 
and it's not the negative that is <laughs> problematic. I think it's really rather the republicanism. And you're totally right. I mean, there's a lot of Arantian spirit in it. But um, to j just put it into one example, uh, uh, Hannah Arendt has this in, in, in her book on the American Revolution. She speaks about this one crucial mo moment of the Pilgrim Fathers on the boat where they give it, uh, to each other a, a promise. This is a moment of solidarity and there's a political promise arising from that. Mm. This is the, like the constitutive moment for, for something political. Patochka is very interested uh, in this very same existential moment. I mean, Arendt, the Pilgrim Fathers on the boat, this is an existential moment, right? The shaking of the boat, they are endangered by the co-travelers and so on. And they, this is the only thing that they can really, that they <laughs> are saved by, to, to, to give this promise to each other. Patochka is very much interested in, in this initial moment, and you mentioned it in the heretical essays, it's everywhere there. It's omnipresent, I would say, this is the crucial moment, but he doesn't want to do any next step. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing that w would, would allow us to, to, to call it Republican. I mean, there, there's nothing clearly uh, political in it. Yeah? It's just this moment of breakthrough, of this shaking. There is no moment of, as Hannah Arendt calls it, of, of a promise, of a political promise. Okay. Uh, Great. We have. Should we take a? Well, we can absolutely. We we'll we'll take. take uh, yeah. Okay. I will, and I will discuss with Ludger afterwards because this is this is this is important. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much for a fascinating lecture. Um, I'm curious uh, a bit about some temporal and global contextualization mm -hmm. of your argument and analysis. Um, if you could say a few words about uh, some inspiration to this s approach in the region, because you presented it kind of <laughs> without, without much historical contextualization. So I'm wondering if, if there are any predecessors mm -hmm. uh, in the region uh, to this style of thinking. And uh, at the same time, I'm wondering if even though this, uh, as, you, as you just uh, highlighted yourself, um, it was a small group of people. There is not really a coherent school of thought in any mm -hmm. way. But uh, has there been any influence beyond the region of Central and East Europe of this way of thinking about Repub republicanism in this political context, uh, or maybe uh, influence from other parts of the world? Mm. So, if we may contextualize a little bit in a uh, in a bigger context rather than just in the in the region. Thank you. Uh, thank you for both uh, questions and for uh, Lud Ludger's uh, point. I, I think that you know, Ludger, we have to we have to discuss this more uh, because I was also tempted to call Patočka as a proto republic republican. You know, somebody who is exactly as you say. I mean, it's opening the way. He is he is giving potentially. If there were people who would pick up on uh, Patočka, maybe differently and more coherent than Havel. Uh, uh, and there were such people, but most of them were going in a phenomenological and philosophical direction, not political philosophy as such. But uh, if there were such a people, uh, he would be a founder of a republican school, and he was not, right? So, so and that is, <laughs> so that is, <coughs> <coughs> I apologize for my uh, coughing. There is an, there is an important um, sort of historical proof uh, there is no sort of Patochkin republican school of thinking or republican. Uh, sort of political movement, but on the other hand, you know, some of his notions really worked quite well in the resident community. Uh, I, I'm not going to write because this is over my possibilities. I'm not going to write uh, the re re reception mm, uh, of Patochkin notions in Charter 77 because this would be a project of many, many uh, people. Because you know, so many people are using Patochkin notions in such a different ways. Uh, the quote that I showed you by uh, in, in Havel, uh, almost 10 years after Patochka died, is, I, is uh, I think one of the little proofs of the fact that there was there was quite a spread of, of Patochkian terms. Which okay, maybe we can't call it, no, or not maybe definitely we can't call it like fully fledged Republican uh, uh, Republican theory, uh, not to speak about Republican political ideology, but. That's that's what I was trying to capture. That's what I am sort of l searching in in Patochka's sort of understanding of politics and freedom. It what else then? Uh, what uh, what else you can use in terms of political uh, reading 
of these notions than republicanism. You know, for me, it's not. It's definitely not liberal. For me, it's definitely not 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 socialist of any possible kind, from radical communist to uh, social. Uh, democratic is definitely not Christian, even though it's very much sort of like always engaged with religious and transcendental question. So for me, okay, I would I would actually agree with you. Maybe we could we I should use the proto republicanism or something of that sort. But I still do not see any other better instrument. But let's discuss it, Rutger. We still have time, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to this discussion. Uh, temporal and global uh, dimensions, um, and th this is a big <laughs> big issue. Uh, this is a big issue in many sense, uh, in many many meanings. Uh, first one is that I think you know uh, that is a huge research in the Republican, uh, especially early modern and modern Republicanism uh, uh, all over Western Europe, which was initiated indeed by the uh, Cambridge uh, School of History of Ideas by Skinner and Pocock and others who rediscovered this Atlantic republicanism, which was present in American and founding fathers, which was present also in England as a counter movement ag uh, against monarchism, which then, of course, there is a lot of research on German uh, early modern republicanism, on French republicanism, which is very different, much more revolutionary, Rousseauian republicanism. And now that is uh, because of the incredible uh, power, not, not power, but a force uh, and influence of the Cambridge School, uh, and people who go there and come back. You know, now you have books, uh, just Holly was sending me this book on Turkish republicanism, you have uh, uh, Israeli republicanism, you have uh, the East Central Europe is, somewhat, is somehow all the time uh, away from this uh, development. There is only one exception, this is Poland, because in Polish, in Polish um, uh, historiography, the attention devoted to noble republicanism of the 16th to 18th century is obviously a big issue, um, uh, which is there all the time. However, very few Polish uh, uh, political theorists and very few Polish historians would sort of like draw the longer line towards uh, like how these republican traditions are then sort of translated uh, to the mass politics of the 19th and 20th, uh, 20th uh, century. Uh, and I think that this is something that's awaiting in East Central Europe for a, a new kind of research. Because, you know, these countries are, the, sensi the political sensitivities in these countries, let's take Czechoslovakia, right? Founded as an in, a, in, in a moment of anti-monarchism, founded by Masaryk, who, I mean, what is he? Like, he's definitely not liberal, he's somewhat socialist. I mean, I think, you know, you can interpret Masaryk as a kind of Republican, is, re re Republican thinker, too. You can, see, you can see and feel that in the Czechoslovak political ideology and the state ideology, there is a lot of Republicanism, if, uh, a lot of uh, Republicanism sensitivities. Unfortunately, we don't have really uh, uh, historical uh, and historiographical an analysis for that. There were many pre predecessors of these people whom they were referring to. Uh, and this is also connected with the fact that you know some is that uh, uh, flourishing in the 1970s and 80s. One of the major part that was filling the pages of some of the journals was reconsideration of historical traditions. This was you know this um, people were uh, were writing and, and dissidents were writing much more on the previous political traditions and history than on human rights. Human rights was as such something that you could. You could refer to, but you don't discuss it so much, right? I mean, this is something that's all. The you have the conventions, you have the Universal Dec Declaration, so you don't really have to write about human rights. But but Polish some is that Czechoslovak some is that Hungarian some is that full of reconsideration of the pre 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 preceding uh, uh, traditions. It's very little on republicanism, but there are many sort of. Um, preceding thinkers such as Masaryk, or in the case of Kuroń, uh, Edward Abramovsky, who was an uh, anarchist uh, thinker with very strong Republican motives and also with a lot of borrowings from Ro Rosa Luxemburg, who actually sort of, who were inspirations for these people. Uh, again, they did not read them as Republicans, but they were following concepts that I interpret as a, either Republican or, or proto-Republican. So there is a lot of this historical, or the, as you said, like temporal, uh, context and the, yeah, the and the global context. This is what I um, was trying to, what I was talking about already. Uh, partly, there is a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, new research on on republicanism, which uh, refers to this neo-Roman uh, thing. Uh, there is very little of of it on uh, East Central Europe. I think that this is something that has to be changed. And you know, my contribution is only a very small one in this uh, in this respect. I don't know if I really answered your question fully, but it is a big question. Thank you. We've got time for one more question, I think. Um, we have that one question. 
Uh, thank you, Michal, for the interesting lecture. I feel like I've learned a lot. Uh, I have rather a comment than a question. I would suggest uh, that you drop the Patochka and his very <laughs> problematic conception of negativity, because yeah. the heretical essays, I think, have a lot of opposition to them, which is a rightful opposition. And his conception of negativity is very Heideggerian in the sense that uh, he interprets the front experience of the soldiers as this confrontation with this nothingness where you find this freedom. And I'm wondering how you can use this very heroic or pathetic interpretation for a political theory uh, in contrast uh, with Hannah Arendt, who we are also stressing, mm. like, Patochka focuses on the negativity, on like this fight with the nothingness, which only a very few soldiers or people in the First World War could transform into like a sense or gaining of sense or freedom for their lives. And a lot of them just ended with post-traumatic shock. So I feel that is a very problematic interpretation by Patochka. And what is maybe more important for the political aspect is that if you stress Arendt, in Arendt freedom is something positive, something you get like in addition to your like private existence when she's referring to the Greek polis and it doesn't stem from negativity. So I just wonder if this like individualistic heroic fight that Patochka portrays, a fight against nothingness, is at all useful for a political theory that wants to ground human rights uh, in a more, I would say, realistic way. Thank you. No, but I, 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 I take your point. I absolutely agree. I would never, if I was political theori theorist, I would never do the thing to connect to Patochka. You know, if I wanted to do a political theory of human rights in a Republican key, uh, there are much better options, Hannah Arendt, one of them. Uh, the Neo Ro Roman Republicans, um, especially Skinner and Lena Heildenius and some couple of others, um, be the other side. And I would forget about Patochka, right? Uh, because I, but the thing is that I don't want to construct any political theory. I don't even want to construct a image that uh, dissidents had a political theory, right? But what I am trying to do as an intellectual historian of, of dissidents is to characterize, and you know, you have to see that this is this, uh, the context that I'm doing. I am speaking about Yiri Hayek, and I am because he knew what he's speaking about. He was a human rights communist and socialist human rights actor all the time. He was also a thinker, and he was developing his social theory. So they were like socialists, they were liberals, and something that I call either Republican or proto-Republican, not theory, but understanding of human rights. So in this sense, uh, I agree with you that maybe the negativity is not, not so much needed. This is also o only something that for me is important in trying to see what, what kind of theory of freedom it is in Patochka when he starts to be engaged in Charter 77 and why this solidarity of the shaken, the community of the shaken is so evocative for the people in Charter 77 that they always uh, speak about it. I think that, you know, I, I side with Petr Rezek and a couple of other interpreters who say that, that, you know, this is most of what Charter 77 has from Patochka is very vulgarized Patochka. I agree, yes, the people were not phenomenologists and philosophers, right? But what, but what I want to sort of capture by this Patochka, exactly because Pat Patochka is the, the deepest of, 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 of them because he is showing the way, is how part of the dissident community was thinking about human rights. They did not develop theory, they did not know that this is, and they did not care that uh, whether or not this is Republican or liberal. But for me, to me, it helps to characterize a part of this end which is different from liberal, which is different from socialist, and is different from Christian. And this is very important. Uh, and because Patochka's influence, because this Patochkianism in Charter 77, I can't, I mean, you said that I should drop Patochka or I should drop Patochka's ne negativity. I would agree with maybe dropping the negativity. I definitely do not agree with <laughs> dropping Patochka because... <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Michal, 
Thank you very much indeed for a terrific monthly lecture. It only remains for me to ask the audience to give you a well-deserved round of applause before we all go downstairs for a glass of wine and further discussion. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. It was great. Thank you.